A native of Lorraine may be the most prolific killer in U.S. history. He has confessed to more than 90 murders, and now he may have another victim right here in Northeast Ohio. Good evening, I'm Lena Lai. And I'm Betsy Kling. Russ and Sarah are off tonight. Andrew Horansky joins us now. And Andrew, you spoke with detectives in Willoughby Hills who believe Samuel Little could hold the key to a decades-old cold case there. That's absolutely right. They interviewed him in December at a prison in Texas, and they say he confessed to killing and then dumping a woman in Willoughby Hills. What he could not provide was any information about her, not even her name, since he said they only spent about 30 minutes together. 78-year-old Samuel Little says he's killed more than 90 women across the country, confessing after a 2013 conviction. On Friday, prosecutors in Cuyahoga County indicted him for two more. The 1984 death of Mary Jo Payton, who Little met at East 105th in Euclid, and the 1991 death of Rose Evans, who he met at East 55th and Central. Yet not for a prostitute he claimed to meet at East 37th and Broadway in the late 70s. Her skeleton found off I-271 in 1983, badly deteriorated in a blue-green dress. He told us that he killed our victim with by strangulation, and he actually took his hands out and like demonstrated like how he like put her his hands around her neck and choked her to death, and that he was just laughing about it when he was doing it. Tonight, they're hoping someone who knew her steps up. We have a confession from someone who has confessed to multiple murders. If this is, indeed is the female that Mr. Little was talking about during our, our interview, he didn't spend the amount of time that he did or have the details that he did in some of these other homicides. Homicides that began in 1970 and lasted 35 years. The victims, vulnerable women addicted to drugs and easily missed. Little could recall their deaths so clearly he drew many of their portraits. But not the one in Willoughby Hills, where investigators now know a lot about a killer and little about the victim. If you have any information, you are asked to call police. We have their information on WKYC.com. Lena, they have DNA evidence that they're working out separately, but really need to ID this person if there's ever to be hope of a prosecution. And so, Andrew, what were the detectives' impressions of Little? And do they really think he could have killed 90 women? Some of my first questions, they do. He's already believed to be the killer in more than half of the cases he's confessed mm -hmm. to. They say he was very unassuming, talked about the Cleveland Browns. Bottom line, they do not see him here is someone who would ever need to lie or embellish, especially because at this point, in exchange for these confessions with law enforcement, the death penalty is taken off the table. All right. Thanks so much, Andrew. Sure. A Fox 2 exclusive tonight in our continuing coverage of cold case murders in the St. Louis area, possibly connected to serial killer Samuel Little. For the first time, we are hearing from the local Illinois State Police investigators who traveled to Texas to question Little. Would you know if you were in the presence of a killer? When it comes to Samuel Little, the answer is probably not. He spent most of his life interacting with people that had no idea that he was possibly doing the things that, that he is now admitting to. For decades, Samuel Little committed crimes across the United States, but until 2014, was never convicted of his most vicious vice, murder. Recently, he's confessed to killing 93 women across the country between 1970 and 2005 some in the St. Louis area. Illinois State Police Lieutenant Calvin Brown is overseeing some of the local cold case investigations involving Little. Right now, it seems that the cases that we are researching appear to all be in the Madison County, Illinois area. Last fall, ISP sent Sergeant Albert Jennings and Special Agent Travis Irwin to Texas to interview Little. It's a lot of weight on you going in, knowing that you're going to be talking to this individual. We tried to clarify certain details and tried to, to find more specifics, things that we could come back and could corroborate with, with uh, the evidence that we have in, in the case files. In order to keep on track, we try to stay with one particular setting before we go to a different one. So when I say setting, I mean one scene or one case before we go to the next one. He, he didn't do anything that you would see somebody that almost fight back. No, he was actively trying to make us understand uh, some of those details to clarify things. One of the cases they asked little about was the 1977 murder of Marianne Jenkins. Last month, we interviewed Jenkins' son about the potential break in the case. We want answers, and we're possibly finna get answers now. And somebody's gonna pay, finally. 
for what happened to her. With the information gathered during their interview, investigators hope they can one day provide justice that until now seemed lost. We're not going to rush anything. We want to do our due diligence and do the best investigation we can to provide the best product, the best outcome we can for, for those families who've lost loved ones. The FBI tells me it's confirmed half of the 93 murders Little has confessed to. In addition to the Illinois State Police, I can confirm there are other local law enforcement agencies that have been contacted by the FBI regarding Little's potential connection to unsolved murders. It's a case that's haunted investigators for more than 40 years. The murder of an innocent woman in Prince George's County that has gone unsolved until now. Thanks for staying with WJZ. I'm Rick Ritter. And I'm Mary Bubala, one of the most prolific serial killers in history, admitted to killing her and close to 100 other victims. Authorities are now turning to the public for help. The mugshot of 78-year-old Samuel Little sends chills down your spine. The man police say admitted to killing as many as 90 people across the country, including an innocent woman in Laurel. I can truly say that Samuel Little is a true monster. Uh, he's every woman's uh, ultimate nightmare. It was the summer of 1972 when Little picked up his victim at a Washington bus station. Later drove her to a wooded area in Laurel where Little says they had sex and then he strangled her to death. He described it uh, when I interviewed him uh, in a way where he was actually excited about describing how he did his, the, this murder. Despite all of that time that passed, Little packs a sick memory. He got excited when he described the case to us. I showed him aerial photos to confirm uh, that we were looking at the or investigating the correct uh, case. And he actually pointed out the dirt roads that he went, went on. Uh, and pointed out exactly where he left her body. It was a hunter who months later found the woman's skeletal remains, but for 45 years, they've been unable to identify her killer. Little had been serving life sentences in California and started confessing in an effort to transfer prisons. Now the focus turns to identifying Jane Doe, a description Little has already shed light on. He described the victim, uh, and the way that the medical examiner described her uh, matched, everything matched. Now, authorities believe the woman was from the Massachusetts area and was recently divorced. They say she was a white female with dirty blonde or reddish hair. Anyone with information is urged to call police immediately. Samuel Little is a known serial killer. He was serving four life sentences in L.A. Samuel Little targets were uh, female. Um, some were uh, either mentally challenged or some type of physical ailment that they had. Uh, Texas Ranger James Holland. Uh, contacted us and uh, told us that he had some leads and information on possible victims in Miami, Florida. The two cases uh, were investigated by myself and my partner Lester Aguilar, both strangled or drowned, uh, depending on which case you look at, and both from Miami and in our, our county, which back then was the Public Safety Department. When we showed him pictures of his victims, he kind of just totally dismissed himself from the conversation and went into his own. Uh, and he relived everything minute by minute from description of the women to what he did to them, how he did it to them, and his, uh, the, the, the final point of him actually just leaving their bodies where they were. If, if you didn't know him, he was a standard older gentleman, uh, crystal clear blue eyes. Um, however, when he started speaking to you, about what he had done, those eyes looked right through you. And that was the first key that was our impression of this guy is uh, he, he's a killer. And the reason behind that was is because when he would start remembering what he did and the descriptions he would give us, you totally saw him just blink out and almost relive the moment and the area he was at when he was describing the murders to us. The FBI released this information Tuesday, giving the world a better understanding of the size and scope of this investigation. <laughs> FBI crime analysis paints a picture of a now frail 78-year-old man sitting in a Texas prison. 
However, what they uncovered about Little's life told a much different story. The man who could now be considered one of the most prolific serial killers in U.S. history has had run-ins with the law dating back to 1956, according to the FBI report. The report reveals Little dropped out of high school and left his Ohio home in late 1950. He lived a nomadic life, never staying in one place too long. The report reads, Little chose to kill marginalized and vulnerable women who were often involved in prostitution and addicted to drugs. Their bodies sometimes went unidentified and their deaths uninvestigated. While the bodies went unidentified, Little didn't forget them. Investigators say he described the victims and murders in great detail, even drawing pictures of many of them. Little has confessed and described in great lengths 90 murders. In some cases, remembering their age, name, where they met, and where he dumped the body. The report identified that DNA evidence was not available or could not produce a clear link back to Little. Since a large number of killings occurred in 1970 to 1980s before DNA profiling was regularly used. For this reason, 60 victims are marked as Jane Doe. It was Little's confession that brought him back to West Texas more than two decades after the reported killing of Denise Brothers in 1994. The most prolific serial killer in American history is behind bars in a Texas prison. Samuel Little has admitted to killing more than 90 women across the country. Now, the 78-year-old is working with investigators, drawing sketches of his victims. And the victims' families are finally getting some closure because of his drawings. In tonight's special report, Inside the Mind of a Serial Killer. As Samuel Little serves his life sentence in an Odessa prison, families across the country are coming forward saying the serial killer's sketches look just like their loved ones. Yeah. Tammy Green got emotional when she saw this sketch of one of Little's victims, who the FBI says was killed in the Memphis area. Green immediately thought of Zena Marie Jones. When I first seen this picture, like I said, it brought tears to my eyes. I hadn't even put these two pictures together yet. It looked like my auntie ain't to me in my eyes. Green's aunt disappeared in 1989 on New Year's Day and they have not seen her since. The family says Jones was a prostitute and on drugs. If you look at her hair right here and look at her hair, they the same length with the same eyebrow, how he got it drawn. This eyebrow is looking exactly like that. Psychiatrist Dr. Dave Davis looks over the sketches and is astonished at the detail. If this is accurate, it's remarkable. For him, the serial killer's mind is something he's never seen before. He's got a book somewhere, or somehow he's got wonderful facial recognition, or he's been keeping a record of these people that he kills somewhere. Throughout the Southeast and even Texas, investigators are following up on calls they've received from other families. Little confessed to killing dozens of women between 1970 and 2005. The 78-year-old says he killed two women in the state of Texas. These two drawings are his victims. However, the FBI has yet to connect these confessions to any actual murders in Wichita Falls and Houston. It's been amazing how these pictures and his memory has been able to solve all these cases across the country. He's the one that provided the information, and then we reached out to the law enforcement agencies to find out if they had a case that matched up with that. And it's been uncanny how many of these cases have been matching up. Back in the Memphis area, the family of Priscilla Baxter Jones saw this drawing and now believes it looks just like their loved one. And I seen the sketch, and I just like, <gasps> Investigators also believe it could be her. He described um, encountering a, a woman. He estimates the age anywhere between 18 and 30, uh, so a young woman. Little is said to be in poor health and will likely die in prison very soon. I hope you rot in hell. I mean that, you know, that's how I feel about it. I just really hope you rot in hell. I hear about too much pain to too many families. Now it's a race for families and investigators to connect his confessions, his drawings, his memories to the more than 90 victims he has admitted to killing. The FBI has created a very detailed website with maps, timelines, and little sketches. Please ask that if you believe your loved one was killed by little, 
Contact them immediately. We have a link to the FBI's report on our website, EastTexasMatters.com. Dozens of unnamed faces all sketched by the same hand that killed them. After Samuel Little confessed to 90 murders across the country, investigators started the long and difficult task of identifying all the faces. This is the case file on Sam Little. Lieutenant Darren Versaja of Pascagoula Police interviewed Samuel Little after he confessed to the murder of Melinda LaPree, which happened in the 80s. But he also confessed to killing this woman in the summer of 1977, a black woman in her 30s or 40s, originally from the Jackson area. He picked her up in a bar in Gulfport. He brought her over here to Carver Village. Uh, they had something to eat, one of the little restaurants down there. Uh, he then took her shortly thereafter and strangled her and killed her. Police say the description Little gave them of the woman and the crime matched the unidentified remains found in December of 1977. The Pascagoula Police Department made its own version of the unidentified victim here and they actually sent it to Sam Little in prison and he drew on this exact piece of paper different uh, things that he wanted to change about that photo to better represent who this person is. We are now pen pals. Through an exchange of handwritten letters, Versaja and Little talk about the crimes, the killer even wishing the investigator a Merry Christmas from prison. And you know, in law enforcement, trying to keep him uh, comfortable with giving me information, sometimes you just gotta, you know, lay down with the devil, and, and he's certainly one of them. He says the relationship, all to put a name to this face and bring her family some closure. As long as it keeps him writing about my victim, if I can ultimately identify her, I'll do whatever it takes to do that. An alleged serial killer may have struck in Knoxville. The FBI says 78-year-old Samuel Little has confessed to 90 murders across the country. That includes three in Tennessee, Memphis, Chattanooga, and Knoxville. WBIR 10 News reporter Stephanie Haynes joins us to explain. And first, Stephanie, there are a lot of questions about whether the claims by this killer are true, and we don't yet know the name of the victim in Knoxville. John, that's right. The FBI says Little's Knoxville confession is unmatched, meaning it's not yet confirmed by law enforcement. And so far, investigators say they've confirmed more than 30 other of those deaths. The local victim is described as an African-American woman aged 25 killed in 1975. The Knox County Sheriff's Office says it is working to confirm the case and notify next of kin. Todd Matthews with the National Missing and Unidentified Person System, or NamUs, says to his knowledge, this person is is not in the system, but he says the news of little is an opportunity to try to help identify people who may have been forgotten. Until we identify all of those people and get them back to where they belong, it's not over. This event still happened. Little was arrested in Kentucky in 2012 and extradited to California on a drug charge. That's where investigators used his DNA to link him to three murders in the late 1980s. He was convicted in 2014 and is serving three life sentences. Coming up at six, could Little be exaggerating and will we ever know? Robin and John. Stephanie. Tonight, investigators plead for your help as they try to identify a woman murdered by the most prolific serial killer in the country. I'm Josh Rowe. And I'm Kim Chapman. The Hamilton County Cold Case Unit revealed this sketch in 3D mold right here of the suspected Chattanooga victim. Kylie Thomas joins us now live with more on this case and what the DA wants from the public tonight. Kylie. Well, this case is unusual because police know what happened to her. They just don't know who she is. They tell me that Samuel Little and her met at a bar along 9th Street, downtown Chattanooga here. That was in the early 80s. And Little recently told them that he only spent an hour's time with her before he says he killed her. Life has a way of moving forward especially along Highway 299 in Dade County. Drivers would likely never know that their daily commute is the heart of an unsolved murder case. These cases may be cold, but they're not forgotten. Uh, we're just waiting on the right piece of information to come in to help us solve them. Nearly 40 years later, Joe Montgomery wants to give her family the answers they've always deserved. If anybody out there missing a sister, a niece, aunt, <coughs> 
uh, daughter, whatever. We're just asking for the public, uh, not just in Chattanooga, but Georgia, Alabama, the whole area. Hamilton County detectives, along with GBI agents, flew to Texas in December to talk to Samuel Little. He's serving life in prison there. He's admitted to killing 90 people. Sometimes he decided to kill rather quickly, and then other times it was drawn out over a, a longer period of time. Investigators watch hours of Little's testimony to prepare for the interview. They say the vivid details that he remembered about his victims amazed them. Little told investigators that this woman asked him for a ride from a nightclub downtown Chattanooga. That's when he says he strangled her and ditched her body in the woods in Dade County. They used her skull to sculpt this new face. Rendering. He was not boasting about what he had done, mm -hmm. um, but but he, but he was very, very emphatic that he wants these people found, those that haven't been recovered and identified, he thinks they should be. Investigators believe that this young black woman was in her early 20s when Little killed her. They're asking people today to relive the past, all in hopes of bringing this cold case to an end. Hamilton County's cold case unit has solved 17 cases in the past four years. And tonight, with your help, they're helping to make that number 18. Live downtown, I'm Kylie Thomas, News Channel 9. Thank you, Kylie. If the sketch or sculpture looks like someone you know, you're asked to contact the cold case unit tip line. You can see that number and the email address right there on your screen right now. You can remain anonymous. Tonight and only on 9 on your side, we're able to report for the very first time that two Cincinnati women were apparently the victims of the most prolific serial killer in U.S. history. We're talking about Samuel Little, who the FBI thinks killed 93 women. And we can report exclusively that local investigators have identified one of those women. And now Hamilton County Prosecutor Joe Dieters reveals her identity and he is asking for your help identifying Little's other local murder victim. He floated around and killed, killed girls. I mean, it takes a long time to kill 93 people. I mean, this is not like a weekend trip. He's doing it all the time. This is Samuel Little, now 79 years old, living out his days in a prison north of Los Angeles. On May 23rd of this year, Hamilton County prosecutors and Cincinnati PD met with Little there. He told them when he looked like this in the 1970s and 80s, he lived in a halfway house in northern Kentucky and killed two women in Cincinnati. He agreed that he would confess to the murders he has committed as long as we don't seek the death penalty, which I would never do except we didn't have a death penalty. So it was a pretty easy decision to make. How would he kill them? He always strangled the girls, always. Little draws pictures of his victims. He makes notes about them. This one, he writes, tall girl, highway by sign, Cincinnati in 1984 or 74. The FBI released this sketch along with dozens of others last year. Now Dieter says her name is Anna Stewart. Investigators found her 33-year-old body in 1981 near a condo complex 100 miles north of Cincinnati. Now the mystery of how she died is solved. Little says he dumped Stewart in Grove City near Columbus. She died of manual strangulation. But Dieter says they have no idea the identity of another local victim that Little admitted just this spring to killing nearly 40 years ago. We've indicted him um, on both murders and we're asking the public's help to possibly identify the, the Jane Doe that we can't identify right now. Little's drawing indicates she wore a wig, and he told investigators he didn't have a pencil dark enough to illustrate the color of her skin. So the prosecutor's office mocked up what she might look like without the wig and darker complected. Little told them she was black, slender, wore glasses, lived in over the Rhine with a heavy female Hispanic. So much detail, he even says the street entrance to her apartment opened to a staircase to the second floor and that he left her body next to a cool cigarette billboard. He just would prey on prostitutes and drug addicts. And um, unfortunately, they weren't missed. He would dump them in remote areas. Because he didn't use a weapon, he was able to conceal the cause of death. 
Dieters tells me they will go back to Los Angeles probably in early August, where Little will plead guilty to both murders via Skype, the first time that he knows of that that's been done in Hamilton County. So as for Jane Doe, the unknown victim, we have all the details about her and who to contact if you might know who she is. It's all on WCPO.com. You know, the prosecutors have a team of interns looking through microfish at the coroner's office as we speak. And then what about Anna Stewart? Well, she had three children. Police have informed them of Little's confession, and we were told that this news has been extremely difficult for them to learn. Well, you know, I, there are some questions obviously swirling around yes. this. I think viewers probably still have questions too. First off, and I wrote some notes here first, why do they believe him in the first place? Why admit it now when he probably could have gotten away with this for the rest of his life? Right. And then the, the details that he has given on all of these women is so very specific. Yep. How can how can he do that? OK, so these are all extremely valid, valid questions. And, and Joe Dieters is going to hold a news conference tomorrow along with the Franklin County prosecutor. That's for the Grove City, mm -hmm. who's in charge of Grove City. We are, of course, going to have that covered. And then as for your questions, we went, we have the answers actually oh. to that. And we've talked at length with not only Joe Dieters, but a criminal expert as well about the mind of a man like this. It is extraordinarily chilling, folks, and it is Oddly fascinating look at this. So I hope that you'll join me tomorrow at 11 for that, including the possibility of um, a third victim from this area. From this area. A third victim in this area um, yet to be discovered. So that's all tonight, tomorrow night at 11. And um, I, 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 it's, I'll it's get just my, an unbelievable I'll get my thing. answers tomorrow night at 11. Yes, you will. I look forward to it. All right, thanks. Tonight, the FBI releasing disturbing details of a man they're calling the most prolific serial killer in U.S. history, possibly targeting women right here in the Bay Area. And now investigators need your help to connect a crime scene stretching from Florida all the way to California. Michael Paluska live in Tampa tonight with new details just coming down. Michael. Paul, the FBI has linked Samuel Little to 90 murder cases across the country. Two of them he says he committed right here in the Bay Area. Don't let Samuel Little's age fool you. The 78 year olds lived a life committing horrific violent crimes, recently confessing to 90 murders. The FBI says the killing spree left women dead all over the country from 1970 to 2005. There are a total of nine murders here in Florida Little confessed to. Two of those cases are in our area. In Tampa, Little admitted to killing a black female in 1984 and in Plant City, the FBI map showing he killed another black female in 1977 or 1978, meeting that victim in Clearwater. The Marion County Sheriff's Office did clear a 1982 murder case, Little confessing to a detective that he killed Rosie Hill because, quote, God put him on this earth to do it. Despite dozens of unsolved murders across the Bay Area and hundreds across the state, the FBI says the victims they are searching for likely won't be on any lists. They are probably all Jane Doe's. The FBI says Little killed vulnerable women often involved in drugs and prostitution. The cases never considered homicides. Tonight, Tampa police telling ABC Action News they've been in contact with the FBI about Little, but so far they have not connected him to any of their unsolved homicides. And Little won't be getting out of prison anytime soon. He is currently serving three life sentences for killing three women in the Los Angeles area. We've reached out to a number of law enforcement agencies across the Bay Area. We are waiting to hear back from them on whether or not they are getting any more breaks in their case because of Little's confessions. We are live here in Tampa tonight. Michael Pluska, ABC Action News. Michael, take a look at this map here. These are all of the places that detectives are digging into cold case murders. You can see a concentration in our area there in Florida. An accused serial killer has confessed to killing 90 women, including two here in the Tampa Bay area. ABC Action News reporter Sarah Hollenbeck is live at the Tampa Police Department for us right now. Sarah, detectives tell you that they're working with the FBI very closely on these cases. Absolutely. Right now this morning, those detectives are looking at several of their cold cases, trying to figure out if there are any connections. Right now, they tell us they have not found any direct connections with Samuel Little, but that doesn't mean that they don't exist. And this morning, they're working very closely with the FBI to find any of those possible links. Now, the FBI says Samuel Little is already serving time in prison for three murders, but he recently confessed to killing 90 women over the course of 35 years. Two of those crimes may have happened 
happened here in Tampa Bay. And here's what Little told those investigators. He admitted to killing a black woman in 1984 in Tampa and another black woman in either 1977 or 1978, who he confessed to killing in Plant City, but he told investigators that he actually met her in Clearwater. Well, he could be the most prolific serial killer in U.S. history, potentially tied to 90 murders. We knew Samuel Little spent time here in New Mexico, and today he confessed one of his alleged victims was a woman in Albuquerque. News 13's Brittany Bade is following this story. Dean, there are a lot of new questions tonight about this 44-year-old cold case. Little's description may match a 1974 cold case here. But there is a possibility the woman was either never reported missing or that her body was never found. This elderly man you see in a wheelchair says he spent decades killing women all across the country. And the FBI says Samuel Little confessed to murdering one of his 90 victims right here in the metro. Just today, the FBI released dozens of murders Little is claiming responsibility for. The crime spanned decades and stretched from California to Florida. And in 1974, Little says he killed a quote 25-year-old white woman in Albuquerque. Investigators have not yet linked Little's confession to a cold case here. But News 13 found at least two articles in the Albuquerque Journal Archives from 1974 with descriptions similar to the former competitive boxer's M.O. He strangled her with his hands. Like he said he did to Denise Brothers of Texas in 1994. The FBI says Little would often kill women by knocking them out and strangling them in such a way that their causes of death were often classified as accidents or natural causes. By the time we get done, uh, it very well may be confirmed that he is the uh, most prolific serial killer in American history. This West Texas DA is currently trying Little for what would be his fourth murder conviction. And he says none of Little's confessions have been disproven. So now investigators here will either be able to solve a 44-year-old cold case or discover that decades ago no one even noticed a vulnerable young Albuquerque woman went missing. Compared to the descriptions of Little's other confessions, the Albuquerque case is fairly detailed. The FBI says Little remembers his crimes in great detail, but sometimes is uncertain about the exact dates. Dean, back to you. All right, Brittany, thank you. Now, we reached out to APD late today to see if the woman's description matched any of their cold cases. They tell us they are looking at their records. We will continue, of course, to keep you updated on this story as we get new information. Investigators say a convicted serial killer is now working with them to identify his victims by drawing portraits of them. Samuel Little is serving multiple life sentences in a California prison, and he confessed to 90 murders nationwide, two of them in Mobile, two in Pascagoula. News 5's Mary Smith has been covering this story for months. She's live in our studio after speaking with Pascagoula police about one one portrait in particular, Mary. Roseanne, that's right. Investigators have been able to confirm 30 of Little's alleged 90 victims. The remaining 60 are still active investigations. Now officials are hoping you'll take a close look at these faces of unidentified victims drawn by Little himself from prison. One of these portraits is a murdered woman in Pascagoula in 1977. Dozens of unnamed faces, all sketched by the same hand that killed them. After Samuel Little confessed to 90 murders across the country, investigators started the long and difficult task of identifying all the faces. This is the case follow Sam Little. Lieutenant Darren Versaja of Pascagoula Police interviewed Samuel Little after he confessed to the murder of Melinda LaPree, which happened in the 80s. But he also confessed to killing this woman in the summer of 1977, a black woman in her 30s or 40s, originally from the Jackson area. He picked her up in a bar in Gulfport. He brought her over here to Carver Village. Uh, they had something to eat, one of the little restaurants down there. Mm -hmm. uh, he then took her shortly thereafter and strangled her and killed her. Police say the description Little gave them of the woman and the crime matched the unidentified remains found in December of 1977. The Pasquale Police Department made its own version of the unidentified victim here, and they actually sent it to Sam Little in prison, and he drew on this exact piece of paper different uh, things that he wanted to change about that photo to better represent who this person is. 
We're now pen pals. Through an exchange of handwritten letters, Versaja and Little talk about the crimes, the killer even wishing the investigator a Merry Christmas from prison. And you know, in law enforcement are trying to keep him uh, comfortable with giving me information. Sometimes you just gotta, you know, lay down with the devil, and, and he's certainly one of them. He says the relationship, all to put a name to this face and bring her family some closure. As long as it keeps him writing about my victim, if I can ultimately identify her, I'll do whatever it takes to do that. And at WKRG.com, you can find an interactive map of these portraits and where Samuel Little claims to have murdered each of those women. Live in the studio tonight, I'm Mary Smith, WKRG News 5. An alleged serial killer may have struck in Knoxville. The FBI says 78-year-old Samuel Little has confessed to 90 murders across the country. That includes three in Tennessee, Memphis, Chattanooga, and Knoxville. WBIR 10 News reporter Stephanie Haynes joins us to explain. And first, Stephanie, there are a lot of questions about whether the claims by this killer are true, and we don't yet know the name of the victim in Knoxville. John, that's right. The FBI says Little's Knoxville confession is unmatched, meaning it's not yet confirmed by law enforcement. And so far, investigators say they've confirmed more than 30 other of those deaths. The local victim is described as an African-American woman aged 25 killed in 1975. The Knox County Sheriff's Office says it is working to confirm the case and notify next of kin. Todd Matthews with the National Missing and Unidentified Person System, or NamUs, says to his knowledge, this person is is not in the system, but he says the news of little is an opportunity to try to help identify people who may have been forgotten. Until we identify all of those people and get them back to where they belong, it's not over. This event's still happening. Little was arrested in Kentucky in 2012 and extradited to California on a drug charge. That's where investigators used his DNA to link him to three murders in the late 1980s. He was convicted in 2014 and is serving three life sentences. Coming up at six, could Little be exaggerating and will we ever know? Robin and John. Stephanie. The serial killer claiming to have more than 90 victims admits two of them happened right here in the Cincinnati area. And good evening, I'm Mike Dardis. And I'm Sheree Palello. Tonight we found out Hamilton County's prosecutor will indict Samuel Little for both of those murders. WLWT News Files Helena Batapaglia is live for us with a preview of the announcement. Helena? Well, Mike and Cherie, Samuel Little is known as one of the deadliest serial killers in U.S. history. He's currently serving three life sentences in California, but has gotten away with killing countless numbers of women uh, over the decades. And uh, tomorrow, the Hamilton County prosecutor will indict him for the murders of two women right here in Cincinnati. The serial killer, known for sketching detailed portraits of his victims, admitting to taking the lives of two women in Cincinnati. Tomorrow, Hamilton County Prosecutor Joe Dieters is expected to indict Samuel Little on both murders, one of them involving 33-year-old Anna Stewart, pictured here in Little's drawing. She was reported missing from Cincinnati on October 6, 1981. Her body found in Grove City just days later. The other woman, prosecutors say, is still unknown. Investigators believe she was black, slender, wore a wig, and lived in over the Rhine. The FBI continues to circulate Little's many sketches, hoping loved ones who are still without answers will recognize their loved ones. Just last Friday, prosecutors indicted Little for the murders of two women in Cleveland, one from 1984 and the other, 1991. Investigators believe his killing spree spans at least 19 states over three decades. The prosecutor's office Office says the 78-year-old is expected to plead guilty in August. He'll be taking his plea over video chat as he is too ill to travel. Now, Little is originally from northeastern Ohio. As we mentioned, he'll be taking his plea over video chat. And according to the prosecutor's office, that will be the first time that is done in Hamilton County. Reporting live tonight, Helena Batapaglia, WLWT News 5. By the way, the new indictments will come on the same day that Little turns 79 years old. Councils, are we ready? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Today's date is Friday, August the 23rd, 2019. This criminal proceeding is being conducted between two sites today. From the Hamilton County Courthouse in Cincinnati, Ohio, 
The time is approximately a little bit afternoon, Eastern Standard Time. In Los Angeles, California, time is a little bit after 9 a.m. Pacific Time. Let's have the introduction of the parties in Cincinnati. My name is Melba Marsh. I'm one of the judges of the Hamilton County Common Pleas Court. And representing the state of Ohio. Joseph Dieter, Hamilton County Prosecutor. Represent with, I'm sorry, Jeff. Please, go ahead. Along with Ron O'Brien, the Franklin County Prosecutor. And representing the defendant, uh, Samuel Little. Norman Aubin, uh, here in Cincinnati, Ohio. In Los Angeles, California, representing the state of Ohio. Mark Pitmar, Hamilton County Prosecutor's Office. And Thank you. And representing the defendant, Samuel Little. On behalf of Mr. Little, Tim McCann in Los Angeles. Anyone else uh, that you want to introduce on the record? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Texas Ranger uh, Jim Holland, who is to the left of us, uh, who's been a big assistance to us, and who's also actually helping both, uh, helping both parties today, the state and the defendant. Thank you very much. Mr. Pete Meyer, why are we here today? Judge, uh, we reached an agreement with Mr. Little back in May. At that time, uh, Detective Kelly Best and myself I came to this prison and met with Mr. Little. He had agreed to uh, give us details on, admit to, and plead guilty to two murders that happened in the city of Cincinnati uh, back in the 1980s time frame. In return, he asked that uh, we not seek the death penalty. And in doing research on the matter, we realized that the one case that we have a specific date on, which is October 11, 1981, uh, the death penalty was actually suspended in Ohio and did not get reinstated until about a week later. So he was not eligible for the death penalty on that case. The other murder happened in a time frame. We're not sure of a specific date, but it happened during a time when we did and we did not have the death penalty. So uh, we did make that agreement with Mr. Little. Uh, he gave his full statement on both of those cases. He's been indicted and uh, we are now here pursuant to criminal rule 43 for the defendant to uh, be arraigned, to enter a guilty plea, and to be sentenced on both of those cases. Thank you very much. Uh, the court has been presented with two indictments uh, by the Hamilton County prosecutor charging the defendant with the commission of felonies. Case numbers are B19-2543, State of Ohio versus Samuel Lodal, murder 2903.02, the High Revised Code a victim, Anna Stewart, on or about October the 11th, 1981, and B-192957, State of Ohio versus Samuel Little murder charge. Uh, Jane Doe, victim, uh, in between 1-1 of 1980 and December the 31st, 1999. Is that correct, Mr. Pietmeyer? Yes, Your Honor. And it's my understanding that the Mr. Little is currently serving multiple life uh, sentences without parole, correct? Yes, it's my understanding he has three life without parole sentences consecutive to each other that he's serving in California. And it's also my understanding that uh, he is currently, you are all currently located at the C California State Prison in Los Angeles County? Yes, Your Honor. And it's my understanding as well as that Mr. Little's health does not permit him to travel back to Ohio to face these felony indictments. Is that correct? Yes, it would be impractical, uh, and also his health would be a problem, yes, Your Honor. And is my understanding that Mr. Little has uh, told the prosecution that he is willing to plead guilty today. Is that correct? Yes, and Your Honor, he has also signed uh, uh, waivers of, pursuant to Criminal Rule 43, waiver of an appearance in person and agreeing to do this proceedings as we're doing them today. Uh, Mr. McKenna has a form signed on each of those cases. You can uh, hold up to the camera if you like. He also has jury waivers on both of these cases and guilty pleas signed on both of these cases. Is that correct, Mr. McKenna? Yes, Your Honor. And Mr. Aubin as well? Yes, Your Honor. And uh, let me just state for the record that the Hamilton County Prosecution Office has made arrangements with the California State Prison in Los Angeles County through the use of Skype equipment with the cooperation of the Hamilton County Law Library for the parties to travel to said prison on this date of uh, August the 23rd, 2019 for the arraignment, plea, and sentencing to occur. Also correct? Yes. And uh, let's 
councils. Uh, let's go over Ohio criminal rules of procedure 43, which allows for such a remote uh, proceeding if all of the following factors occur. Let's go through the factors one at a time, please. It is appropriate notice to all parties. The record will reflect that all parties have received notice. Am I correct, councils? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. And the court uh, makes, uh, will make a provision to allow private communication between Mr. Little and counsel. Mr. Kenna, certainly being physically present with your client, Mr. Little, today, uh, you've been given the opportunity to have private communications with him. However, if you or Mr. Aubin need to speak or consult with your client any time during this proceedings, all you would have to do is ask and it will be granted. Microphones in this room will be disengaged. Understood, councils? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. McKenna in the Los Angeles and Mr. Aubin here in Cincinnati, you're both present for the record, am I correct? That's correct, Your Honor. And you're yes. both participating, am I correct? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. And you're both consenting to this format, is that correct, councils? Yes, Your Honor. Yes. Let the record reflect that both councils are present. Both councils are participating. Both councils are consenting to the format in this proceedings. Thus, this proceedings may involve sworn testimony that will be subject to cross-examination. Uh, let's go to the next factor. The defendant may waive in writing or on the record the defendant's right to be physically present. Councils, Mr. Aubin, Mr. McKenna, are you waiving your client's presence here today in this proceeding? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. And finally, the last three factors of Criminal Rule 43, I'll take these factors directly with the defendant, Samuel Little himself. Mr. Little, it is part of Rule 43 is that you must be able to see and to hear these proceedings. Also, you must, this proceedings must allow you to speak and to be seen and to be heard by the court and the parties. For the record on the monitor, I can see the parties. I can see Mr. Pietmeyer. I can see Mr. McKenna. I can see the officer. And I can see the, the individual along, sitting along with uh, Mr. Um, Pietmeyer. And for the record, I see another individual who I've identified as Samuel Little. Mr. Little, for the record, I need to hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, I'll speak louder. Uh, I will speak louder. Mr. Little, can you hear me? Yes. Mr. Little, can you see me? Uh, I can barely see you. All right. For uh, the, uh, I'm going to raise my hand. Mr. Little, can you see me? I see you. For the record, would you please state your full name? Uh, Samuel Little. Would you please state your date of birth? 6 7 40. Mr. Little, are you waving? Are you giving up your right to be physically present in Ohio? Yes, ma'am. Are you subjecting yourself to the, this jurisdiction and to the authority of this court? Yes, ma'am. Let the record reflect the following. Defendant has an open court with counsels present, waived his physical body presence today, and submitted to the authority of the state of Ohio. And thus, at this time, Mr. Samuel Little, by Skype, you have entered into the state of Ohio. You are currently in Hamilton County, Ohio, in the city of Cincinnati, at the Hamilton County Courthouse, you are in a room in the law library, which is now a court of common pleas courtroom. In my presence, Judge Melba Marsh, Judge of the Common Pleas Court General Division, Mr. Little, you are in my courtroom as though you are physically standing in front of me. Do you understand, sir? Yeah. Madam Clerk, the arraignment. This is case number B1902957, Samuel Little, also known as Samuel McDowell. You've been indicted with one count murder. And also in case B1902543, 
Samuel Little, also known as Samuel McDowell, you've been indicted with one count murder. Have you received copies of your indictments? Your Honor, for the purposes of arraignment, he would plead not guilty, but then we would move on to actually tendering a plea of guilty, which we've executed today. All right, thank you very much. And I have a set of forms, counsel. At this particular point in time, the arraignment will be accepted. And you waive any defects in regards to the arraignment at this time, Mr. McKenna? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Aubin? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you very much. And also, I will sign the entry authorizing the arraignment, the guilty plea, and sentence of the defendant via remote video pursuant to Criminal Rule 43 at this time. Any objections, counsel? No, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. All right. Mr. McKenna, in front of you, you should have a set of forms. One of them is captioned B192543. And one copy, one document is entry waiving jury trial, and the other companion is entry withdrawing plea of not guilty and entering a plea of guilty. Do you have both of those documents for that particular you, case number? I will, I will hold them up for the camera. I will represent to the court that this is the entry waiving jury trial with Mr. Little's signature that I personally witnessed, as well as mine. And I also hold up the plea form on case number B19-02543, and will represent to the court that Mr. Little has initialed and signed it, as have I, and I witnessed him sign it. All right, let's proceed with the entry waiving jury trial. It reads, Mr. Little, I, Samuel Little, the defendant of the above cause, hereby knowingly, intelligently, and voluntarily waive and give up my right to a trial by jury. Is that correct, sir? Yes, ma'am. Now, Mr. Little, you fully understand that under the laws of this state, you have a constitutional right to a trial by jury, which you are giving up. Is that also correct? Yes, ma'am. Mr. McKenna, do you concur with your decision, with your client's decision to waive the jury? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Aubin, do you also concur with your client's decision to waive the jury? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. The jury waiver will be accepted in case number B192543. Let's move on to the next document if we can. Entry withdrawing plea of not guilty and entering a plea of guilty in case number B192543. And it, it caption is entry, withdrawing plea of not guilty and entering a plea of guilty. And on the last page, there's a signature line. Mr. McKinnon, will you point that out to your client? Your Honor, can he hold that up to the camera so you can see the signatures? All right. Yes, yes ma'am. Mr. McKenna, there's been a request by the prosecutor that you hold that up so we can also see from here. And would you mind walking to the camera, Mr. McKenna? Yes, I'll walk to the camera. I'll represent to the court that's his signature. All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Prosecutor? That's fine, Judge. Thank you. And let's move to the second case. Mr. Uh, McKenna, which is B192957. And it also has two documents. One is an entry waiving jury trial, and the other one is an entry withdrawing plea of not guilty and entering a plea of guilty. Let's look at the entry waiving jury trial first. It reads that I, Samuel Little, the defendant of the above cause, hereby knowingly, intelligently, and voluntarily waive and give up my right to a trial by jury. Is that correct, Mr. Little? Yes, and Mr. Lilly, you fully understand that, that under the laws of this state, you have a constitutional right to a trial by jury on this charge. Is that your understanding as well, sir? I am. Mr. McKenna, do you concur with your client's decision to waive the jury on this case number? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Aubin, do you concur with your client's decision to waive the jury on this case number? I do, Your Honor. And. Mr. McKenna, would you show your client the entry withdrawing plea of not guilty and entering a plea of guilty and turn to the last page of that document? 
And is there a and is there a signature on that uh, page? There is, Judge. Would you like me to approach the camera? Yes, please. This is the second plea form. I represent to the court that is his signature, and I watched him sign it. Thank you. Mr. Little, you have signed both of these guilty finding pleas, haven't you? Yes. Let's go through the documents at this time. Yes, Thank you, pardon? They yes, both yes. Thank you. They both begin the same as in B192957, as in B192543. They start, I, Samuel Little, the defendant in the above cause, hereby freely and voluntarily withdraw my former plea of not guilty and enter a plea of guilty. Mr. Little, on the first indictment, B192543, what is your plea to the charge of murder? Guilty. It is a special felony. Potential sentencing range is 15 years to life. Mandatory time, yes. Maximum yeah. fine is $15,000. Let's move to the other indictment, B192957. It reads the same as the first. I, Samuel Little, the defendant of the above cause, hereby freely and voluntarily withdraw my former plea of not guilty and enter a plea of guilty to murder. Mr. Little, is your plea to the charge of murder one of guilty? Yes. And that is count one, murder 290302, special felony, potential sentence, 15 years to life, mandatory prison time, yes, and the maximum fine, I incorrectly said $15,000 for the first charge. It should be $25,000 maximum fine. Am I correct, counsels? Yes, it's 25. 25. 25. Okay. <clears throat> so, fine, Judge. Thank, thank yes, you. Yes, Your Honor, I agree. Thank you very much. And let's proceed with the uh, plea, Mr. Little. I am not reading the post-release control information from the state of Ohio since you will not be subject to post-release control in this state. I am not reading the community control probation information on this plea form since you're not going to be subject to the community control probation. I will pick up the form at this particular point. Are you satisfied with your attorney's advice and counsel? I am. On both indictments. Are you satisfied, yeah. Mr. Little, on both yeah, indictments? Are you under the influence of drugs or alcohol at this time? No, I hope not. Have you been forced or threatened in any way that caused you to sign and offer these pleas to the indictment today? No, I haven't been paid. You understand, by pleading guilty to both indictments, you give up your constitutional rights to a jury trial. By pleading to both indictments, you give up your right to confront witness against you. By pleading guilty to both indictments, you give up the right to have subpoenaed witnesses walk in this courtroom in your favor. By pleading guilty to both indictments, you give up the right to require the state of Ohio to prove your guilt beyond a reasonable doubt at a trial at which you cannot be compelled to testify against yourself. Do you understand your rights of pleading guilty to both indictments? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Little, you understand that these pleas of guilty to both indictments are a complete admission of your guilt to the charges. Do you understand that, sir? I do. And you understand, sir, that you must give your DNA, I'm sure you have given it to the state of Ohio, as well as to the uh, state of uh, California. My last question, are you a citizen of the United States of America? Yes. Councils, Mr. McKenna, Mr. Aubin, I know you've explained to your client prior to signing these plea forms 
in both cases involving both indictments to the charge of murder. I know you've spoken to him about the penalties involved as well as his constitutional rights in both cases. Is that correct, counsels? Yes, Your Honor. And is it your opinion, do you represent that it is your opinion that Mr. Samuel Little, your client, is competent to enter these pleas to both indictments and is doing so knowingly, intelligently, and voluntarily? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Prosecutor, Mr. Piedmeyer, what are the facts? Your Honor, uh, first of all, with reference to a victim notification, earlier this week I spoke with the family of Anna Stewart. I spoke with a daughter, Tanya Smith, who lives in Tennessee, also a sister, Lois Jones, who lives in Ohio. I meet one of them, wanted to attend the hearing in your courtroom today. Both of them, both of them expressed a lot of uh, gratitude for the work of uh, Jim Holland from the Texas Ranger, Kelly Best from the Sensei Homicide Squad, and the Hamlin County Prosecutor Jim Dieters and Franklin County Prosecutor Ron O'Brien for their efforts on these cases. With reference to the facts, uh, 192543, the murder of Anna Stewart, this happened on October 11, 1981 in Cincinnati, Ohio. On that date, the defendant purposely caused the death of Anna Stewart. She was a 33-year-old unmarried mother of three. Uh, she had a drug problem and she did engage in prostitution from time to time. Uh, she was last seen approximately October 6, 1981, and her body was found in Grove City, just south of Columbus, on Monday, October 12, 1981. Within a couple of days, she was identified as Anna Stewart, but little else was known about her. Uh, the cause of death was ruled to be strangulation, manual strangulation. The manner of death was homicide. It wasn't until the defendant uh, came forward late last year and then earlier this year when Detective Best and myself interviewed Mr. Little that he actually uh, admitted that he was the one that caused her death, indicated he was in downtown Cincinnati in the over the Rhine area uh, looking for a prostitute, didn't find her on the street. Uh, she voluntarily got in a car with him and voluntarily was going to engage in sex. At that point, he did cause her death by strangling her, uh, did not want to leave the body in that area because there were a lot of people around. Drove north on I-71 and gave very specific details on where he left her and how he left her, and all of the details he gave on this case did match. The second case, 1902957, was listed as a Dane Doe, and a detective best has worked tirelessly still trying to, and if she's confident at some point, will have a positive identification. On that case, again, the defendant was in downtown Cincinnati, uh, was on a hillside, and we're not sure exactly where. We think it might have been Sycamore Hill or one of the hills going up to Mount Adams, but saw a lady standing in the doorway of a, a building with stairs that left up, led up to a second story. She motioned for him to come in. He went upstairs with her. There was a, another female there that he identified as a heavyset Puerto Rican. Uh, they did agree, Mexican, I'm sorry, Mr. Little corrected me, he said a Mexican. They uh, agreed to do some drugs together and left to do that. Again, she voluntarily got in the car with him, uh, voluntarily left with him, had agreed to have sex with him, and again, he ended up strangling her, uh, drove some distance away, but we believe close somewhere in downtown Cincinnati area, left her body on a hillside. He thinks it might have been under a billboard, uh, possibly a, for cool cigarettes. The other thing uh, Mr. Little told myself and Detective Best back in May when we interviewed him is that uh, he never raped any of these women, he never kidnapped any of these women. They always voluntarily went with him. His purpose in picking them up was to kill them. And his, he described it as the, his sexual gratification wasn't actually manual strangulation. The uh, actual, his bare hands on the bare necks, that's what actually uh, got him sexually aroused and that's why he did this. It wasn't for any other reason. He also said he specifically looked for people that would not be missed. He said he wasn't gonna pick up a teenager or a housewife because they would probably be missed pretty quickly and might be 
Khan. He looked for people that appeared to be homeless, possibly a prostitute, people that would, if they went missing for a couple days, their family members would probably not immediately uh, notify the authorities, and that's what happened in these cases. He also, uh, once he concluded what he was doing, would leave town as quickly as he could. And one other note, uh, we met again last night with uh, Texas Ranger James Holland. Uh, Mr. Little was admitted to 93 murders, and the uh, Texas Rangers and other law enforcement authorities to date have actually been able to corroborate over 60 of those. Uh, they're confident that at some point they will corroborate each and every one of them. You know? And that basically judges our uh, statement of facts. Thank you very much. Mr. McKenna, any statement? Nothing on the facts, Judge. Uh, Mr. Aubin, any statement? Nothing on the facts, Your Honor. Mr. Prosecutor, any statement? No, ma'am. Thank you very much. There'll be a finding of guilty to count one, uh, B-19-2543, murder, um, and in regards to B-19-2957, uh, count one, be a conviction of murder. And Mr. McKenna, Mr. Aubin, anything that you would like to say at this particular point in time? Your Honor, uh, in mitigation on, be on behalf of Mr. Little, 79 years old, he is in very poor health, he's in a wheelchair, he has diabetes, he is a very intelligent person, however I think the best thing in mitigation is that he came forward and confessed on these unsolved murders. He informed me at this stage in his life he would like to do what he can to make it as right as he can by cooperating on these murders, and uh, beyond that, Judge, we would submit. Thank you. Mr. Hobbin, anything? Only, Your Honor, that he's doing three consecutive life sentences in California now. Thank you very much. And finally, Mr. Little, Mr. Samuel Little, is there anything that you wish to say before I pronounce sentence? I don't know. No, Your Honor, he said no. Thank you. The sentence for the, uh, for each one, of the indictment carries a sentence of 15 years to life imprisonment, and that will be the sentence of this court. As you're well aware, the court has the opportunity, if the law provides it, to make a finding of consecutive sentence. And if so, I must make, I must articulate my sentencing findings and my considerations for imposing consecutive sentences. I hereby make the following factual findings. Uh, per the defendant's own confessions, Mr. Little has spent uh, decades traveling the United States and strangling women along the way. Uh, Little, Mr. Little has confessed to a dozen of other killings, uh, like Cincinnati's Jane Doe, and many of his victims remain unidentified except for sketches that he has drawn to help or assist law enforcement to find his uh, victims and their whereabouts. In Cincinnati during the 80s, the prosecutor said that he killed two, Anna Stewart, a mother, uh, and a self and a still unidentified Jane Doe. Uh, if every one of uh, his 90 confessions per the uh, state, uh, the Texas Ranger is accurate, uh, Mr. Little could be the most prolific serial killer in the history of the United States. The, I hereby make the following findings uh, that Consecutive sentences are necessary to protect the public from future crime or punish the offender. And the consecutive sentence is not disproportionate to seriousness of conduct and danger offender poses to the public. And the final factor, offender's criminal history makes consecutive sentences necessary to protect the public. Therefore, the sentences will be 15 years to life on each, running consecutive to each, and consecutive to any time that he is currently serving in the California court system. Anything further from Mr. McKenna? No, Your Honor. Anything further from Mr. Aubin? No, Your Honor. Anything further from Mr. Peekmeyer? No, Your Honor. Anything further from Mr. Dieters? No, ma'am. Mr. Uh, Samuel Little, I have the give you the right to an appeal for these proceedings. If you cannot afford counsel, counsel will be provided. If you cannot afford all transcripts, all transcripts will be provided. Counsel, Mr. McKenna, as well as Mr. Aubin, do you anticipate an appeal? And if you do so, tell me who you would like to appoint, have appointed, I should say. 
Your Honor, I've spoken to Mr. Little. Uh, he will not be appealing. That's my understanding, Your Honor. All right. And, Counsel, at this particular point in time, on this uh, 100th anniversary of this uh, very courthouse that we're standing in, the Hamilton County Courthouse, this has been another first in the history of this building, another mo moment for history. I'd like to thank Mr. Beekmeyer, Mr. McKenna, Mr. Prosecutor, and Mr. Aubin for their cooperation in making this happen, as well as the Hamilton County Law Library. If there's nothing further, end of record. Thank you, Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.